And the next speaker is Amy McKenna, and she is a scientist at Florida State University's National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. And the title of her talk is Environmental Forensics, Molecular Insight into Oil Spill Weathering Helps Advance High, field, <coughs> high, mag ha high Magnetic Field Mass Spectroscopy. Big clunky laptop, I need to get one of those new Macs I hear everybody talking about. Well, thank you everybody for your time um, and for sticking around. I'm an analytical chemist, but please don't hold that too much against me. Um, everything that we do in our group in the ICR facility at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory or the Mag Lab, as we like to say for short, involves using physics to solve complex chemical processes to address global energy needs, as well as those needs also overlap with the environment, which we'll talk to you about um, here in a few minutes. So someone told me a long time ago that if you don't go into work every day feeling like you're the dumbest one in the building, that you work with the wrong people. So I work at a physics lab, but I'm a chemist. So we are located um, in Tallahassee, Florida, at Florida State University, about a mile away. Those of you who are familiar with the facility probably spend the majority of your time down here um, where the big superconducting magnets are. As you can tell, they pushed us all the way to the other end of the building, and that's where they keep all of the chemists. We also have um, NMR scientists who share the building with us as well. And we're a user facility. We're funded by NSF to be open access to all scientists. So one thing we've heard a little bit talking about this morning um, is the global energy needs of around the world. One of the big issues is that we're not running out of oil, we're running out of the oil that's easy to get at, that's easy to refine, and that's um, going to re require very little energy input. So that's this picture that I have over here in the left, uh, sorry, which is, the, this is light, sweet crude oil. So this is what we're running out of on terrestrial land sources. What we do have left, about 70% of the global oil supply is very heavy, highly viscous, very difficult to refine. It requires a high amount of energy in order to get usable products out of it. Um, it you've got oil sands, which are called bitumen. This is located in Canada. And then if you just look at the difference in the viscosity on the lower right corner, that's what they call extra heavy oil. This has the viscosity of peanut butter. So if you think about trying to pipe peanut butter through a pipeline, you're going to have to put in a tremendous amount of heat in order to reduce the viscosity so that it will flow or use water and do what's called hydro transport, which is an environmental nightmare. So just to quickly highlight some of the geopolitical impacts of having petroleum centered in North America, it's very good for the United States to try and reduce its dependence on Middle Eastern oil. No North America and South America are relatively stable political climates. The problem is, is the oil that is located there is of very low quality. It is these oil sand bitumen, which is a, a thick, it's a clay-like substance. It's mixed with oil and clay, and it's very viscous. It's, it's essentially crude oil. It's on its way to be crude oil in 50 million years, but we're intercepting it and trying to produce it um, as we speak currently. So this is what it looks like. Bitumen is like clay. It's kind of like Play-Doh. It's just a semi-solid form of petroleum. And why do we care? Well, nobody really wants to pay $5 um, for a barrel of oil, and the oil industry is going to pass along those increased, um, their increased cost to, in order to refine a barrel of crude oil along to, along to the consumers. So oil companies sell molecules. Petroleum is Mother Nature's best invention. It's what happens to biomass that's been cooked and squeezed in the Earth's mantle for 50 million years if you're the oil sands in Athabasca up in Alberta, Canada, or 100 million years if you're the Deepwater Horizon crude. So this is what happens to you and me, to proteins, to biomass that's deposited in, sediment, in sedimentary layers and exposed to temperatures and pressures um, in the Earth's mantle. It's proteins. It's what happens to proteins after 100 million years. So you have all of the heteroatoms, all of the atoms that are in proteins. You have sulfur, you have nitrogen, you have oxygen, and you have carbon and hydrogen. So what we've developed at the Mag Lab is what we refer to as petroleumics. So the issue is if you can understand the molecular composition of a crude oil well enough at the molecular level, you can predict 
what the oil is worth, what you're going to be able to get out of it in terms of high value distillates and how to better refine it. As I mentioned, we're running out of light, sweet crude oil, but we still have oil that's left. If we can make more efficient use of the oil that we have available, then we're going to be able to address global energy needs. So this is a problem. If you want to know if you're going to sink a $200 million well in 8,000 feet of water, if you're going to get enough oil out that's going to be beneficial to address environmental as well as economic needs of the oil industry. So you want to be able to predict if you're going to have these types of deposition forming in your pipelines. The upper right-hand picture is a pipe inside of a refinery where you can clearly see that you've got large deposition throughout the pipe, so you're not going to be able to pump as oil as quickly through that. And this deposition is catastrophic on terrestrial land source, but devastating when you're in 8,000 feet of water. Just the removal alone will cost a half a million dollars on a land source versus $3 million. So oil companies want to know what is the composition of the oil that is forming these deposits and how can we prevent this from happening so that we can have um, better use of the oil that we have out there. More importantly, this loss of production formed by deposition like this costs the oil industry $1.2 million a day. So every time they shut down a rig, every time they shut down a platform or an offshore production facility, it's $1.2 million. That's a huge drain on the global energy resources. The same thing that causes problems in the refinery causes problems in the environment. So we recently, unfortunately, conducted a huge scientific experiment in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico where 5 million barrels of oil were released into the Gulf of Mexico over 87 days. And 11 people died that day because we're drilling in 8,000 feet of water because we want to get at this high value, easy to refine, light, sweet crude oil. So this is an overhead view of the oil slick that occurred. The oil slick covered about the square mileage of South Carolina. So that's pretty devastating. One thing that's interesting is the Gulf of Mexico is full of natural petroleum seepage. Every month, a conservative estimate is that you have an Exxon Valdez type spill that happens in the Gulf of Mexico every month just by natural petroleum seeps. Mother Nature takes care of what she makes. So the way that this oil is changed and modified um, in the Gulf of Mexico gives a great opportunity for scientists of all disciplines to come together and understand oil degradation. So we care because we are located in Tallahassee, and this star here is approximately where the Maglab is. We're 18 miles from the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, and this is an overhead view that was taken from NASA that shows the oil slick and the Deepwater Horizon rig right here is where it was located about 50 miles offshore from New Orleans, the mouth of the Mississippi River. So one thing you want to know is what are the, who are the toughest kids on the block? What is going to happen to the, what, what oil molecules are going to remain? You have to know the composition of what was released, and then you can characterize what washes ashore and do a mass balance to see how that oil, how those molecules have been changed um, in the environment. So I like to refer to this as the toughest kids on the block. Everybody else, the little wimpy guys, they're gone. They're biodegraded. They're metabolized in various aquatic ecosystems. But the ones that are left are the ones that are recalcitrant, and they're environmentally persistent and very important in order to characterize. So we've worked with um, collaborators at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute who have been collecting samples since the spill started. And you see this upper right-hand corner, they ref we refer to these as like, they look like half-baked brownies. When you pick them up out of the sand and break them in half, they're gooey in the middle, just like you would think of a half-baked brownie. Not that that's not appetizing to think about when it's petroleum. It definitely doesn't smell as good as a chocolate-covered brownie. So we measure the mass of molecules. So... You have a crude oil, every crude oil is unique. It's unique in terms of where it was formed, where its geographic origin is, and the type of biomass that was used to form this material, and how Mother Nature decided to cook and squeeze it. So you've got more than a million molecules in one single crude oil. You can include isomers and different structural rearrangements. That's a very conservative estimate of the complexity. So what we care about is we need to know if there are these aromatic, condensed molecules that are very difficult to refine. The polar compounds, those are going to have a very low volatility. They're going to be higher in oxygen content, which makes them more easily integrated into the water-soluble ecosystem. You want to know about the sulfur. From an environmental perspective, 
The sulfur is very important because sulfur upon combustion forms sulfur dioxide and goes into the atmosphere and then forms sulfuric acid and rains down. So the EPA mandates that all gasoline has to be less than 10 parts per million in sulfur, but now you're looking at heavy, highly viscous oil feeds to the refineries that have up to 10% by weight sulfur. So you got 10% by weight and you've got to get down to 10 ppm. You have to understand the sulfur that's in the crude oil in order to figure out efficient ways to remove it. Nitrogen also is a big problem. It has many implications in destroying catalysts when they try and do upgrading. So if we can measure the mass of these molecules, we can establish a molecular fingerprint. So what I'm showing you here is just an example of a broadband. This is a mass spectrum. So you measure the mass of all of the molecules. If you can measure mass accurately enough to five decimal places in a complex organic mixture, you can tell the elemental composition of that one particular peak. And that's exactly what we do. We have established here this molecular fingerprint. So this is a deep water horizon crude oil. As I mentioned, it's a very light, sweet crude oil, but that does not mean that it's not extremely compl complex. So if you just zoom in here at one tiny little window, this is at everything that has mass 489. I'm in about a 20 millidalton window, and you've got more than 14 peaks at that nominal mass unit. So before you can even start to establish this molecular fingerprint, you have to be able to identify the molecules that are present. You've got to pick the right tool for the job. So analytical chemists always are grouped together with other scientists to help establish which technique is going to help them answer the questions that they're trying to address. Measuring the mass of molecules in complex organic mixtures needs a very precise, very accurate, and sometimes expensive scale. So here's our scale that we use here. This is at the mag lab. We use superconducting magnets to do and facilitate our measurements. So what we do is called Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometry. And if you've ever been with analytical chemists or have friends that speak to other analytical chemists, we like to use anagrams. So if you don't have an anagram, then you really didn't create anything. So this we refer to as FTICR mass spec. And we use superconducting magnets that are located at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. One thing that's unique is that our magnets are horizontal bore. So unlike NMRs where you have a vertical bore magnet and the majority of the split and the resistive and high field magnets that are used at the other end of the building are all vertical bores. We use horizontal bores because we slide a mass spectrometer inside of the bore of the magnet and I'll show you that a little more. Um, precisely here in a second. So why do we want to do FTICR mass spectrometry, spectrometry for crude oil? We have million dollar instruments and now you're going to come and you're going to spray oil inside of a superconducting magnet. It was a big battle for us to become the dirt sprayers of the analytical world who were spraying petroleum into every part of the instrument, but it has enabled the field to advance an order of magnitude since its inception. So you need ultra high mass accuracy. You have to measure mass to five decimal places at the minimum in order to be able to tell its elemental composition and ultra high mass resolving power. So if you have very closely spaced peaks that differ in mass by very little, by approximately the mass of an electron, you need to be able to see a valley between those two peaks. And the way that you do that is by facilitating this inside of high magnetic fields. So just to show you quickly, this is theoretical mass resolving power. So what the take home message is here is you have two isobaric splits in petroleum that you have to resolve or you're not going to be able to get the, the answer right. So this is the difference between getting the wrong elemental composition and getting the answer right. Knowing if there's sulfur there or assigning something to a different composition. And these splits are highlighted right here. So this is 1.1 millidalton. That's about the mass of two electrons and 3.4 millidalton, slightly above that. And these are overlaps that occur with molecules that have the same nominal mass, 36 millidalton for 3.4 and 48 um, dalton for the 1.1. So this is a function of high magnetic field strength as well as as long as you can detect the signal. And we'll talk about that a little bit further here. So if we zoom in on our flagship petroleum instrument, this is our 9.4 Tesla instrument. One thing that's unique about this magnet is that it's got a very wide bore. 
It makes it very easy to machine pieces and to change out instrumentation inside of a 20 um, centimeter bore versus something that's only five centimeters long. So we make our ions at atmospheric pressure, and then we transfer them through various ion optics inside of the center of the magnetic field where we have a penning trap, which is our ICR detection cell, which is basically a magnetic field trap um, with electrostatic potentials that we uh, use to excite our ions. One thing that's unique about this instrument, you can always tell is it's custom made because there's tin foil on the top of it, so that's proof, and there's a lot of wires. So we design all of our mass spectrometers in-house. We don't rely on commercial systems because we can implement any new advancements in technology. Um, we're about a year and a half ahead of all the instrument companies. We have a gate valve. So because we operate inside of a superconducting magnet, we have to be at very low pressure inside of the ICR cell to do our measurements. When we're spraying petroleum, heavy, nasty petroleum into the front end, it gets really dirty. You want to be able to clean it. So this is a unique feature of this instrument is that we have a source isolation gate valve that allows us to vent the whole front end to atmospheric pressure so that we can clean everything um, in between measurements. So once we get the ion inside of the magnetic field, we have a charged particle. Inside of a magnetic field, it rotate, rotates at a frequency that's inversely proportional to its mass to charge ratio. This is called its cyclotron frequency. Frequency is the parameter of molecules that you can measure more accurately than anything else. So we measure the cyclotron frequency. As you would expect, the light ions or the little guys, they're going to have a much faster frequency. They're going to go a lot quicker than the bigger, heavier molecules, and they have a lower frequency. And if we know the magnetic field strength, we can calculate the mass-to-charge ratio. So here M, of course, is mass, and Q is the charge of the particle. So once we have the ions inside the magnetic field and they're all rotating in their individual cyclotron frequencies that's mass to charge dependent, we have to excite them so that we can detect them. So right now, here, they're in the center of the magnetic field and we apply an electrostatic um, field to the whole entire ICR cell population to excite them to a larger radius to where we can detect them. And as the ions pass inside, I'm sorry, pass next to these detection electrodes, they induce a current onto those electrodes, which we're able to um, detect very accurately and then translate to the mass to charge ratio. And we do this all simultaneously, so all at a time. So we've got 100,000 different mass to charge ratios with about 100,000 ions in every mass to charge ratio packet all rotating inside of an ICR cell at the same time. So one experiment takes us about 15 minutes in order to collect the data, about three days to process um, the data after that. But that's what graduate student labor is good at doing. Um, that and writing software to allow us to do that. So just to put this into a, a simple picture, resolving power for ICR mass spectrometry is either getting the answer right or getting the answer wrong. For petroleum, it definitely means that if you're trying to use a lower resolution instrument, you might get some idea of what the picture is, but you're not able to identify all of the components. So you require high magnetic field FTICR mass spectrometry. You get a pseudo-Gaussian distribution. Mother Nature abhors a vacuum. Everything that she makes is a continuum. Petroleum is continuous in the way that the molecules are organized, the way that the hetero atoms are grouped together, and it's continuous in boiling point. And that makes it a very powerful tool for allowing us to identify um, complex physical processes inside of the ICR experiment itself. And just to further highlight the molecular fingerprint, so here's another zoom in set at a slightly higher mass, because as you go up to higher mass, you need more resolving power, because if you've got 50 carbon atoms and you can figure out how to put them together, and then you have 75 carbon atoms, you've got about a difference of Avogadro's number in the structural rearrangements that you can do. So that makes it very unique for us to be able to have the capability to characterize these molecules at the elemental composition level across the entire distribution in one single experiment. But in order to do that, all of the ions have to play nice inside the ICR cell. All of the master charge packets that are really big, the highly abundant clouds, have to be very nice to the little guys. And we all know that doesn't happen. And they have to do that for a long period of time across the entire detection signal. So this is what our detection signal looks like. It's an FID, a free inductive decay. All of these are individual sine waves if you zoom in. So this is our signal as it's damping out throughout the entire detection period. And you want to see this dampening throughout the entire signal or else you're not 
detecting any signal. What you're actually then detecting is electronic noise. So this is a very difficult experiment to do. ICR has been advanced um, in the past five years alone, um, nearly a factor of 10 in terms of sensitivity, res resolving power, um, and instrument and number of detected ions just because of our ability and our need to look at these higher complexity compounds and samples. So what happens is you get all of these ions, everybody's dancing together inside of the ICR cell. They're all rotating at their cyclotron frequencies, but they, they can bang into each other. And in ICR, it is the fundamental limiter. It's called space charge. Those ions start to actually see each other. While you're measuring their frequency, if they're bumping into the guy next to them, then their frequency is changing, and you're not really measuring the frequency of the individual ion packet. You're measuring the frequency of the guy after he got pushed. So that's really important when you have these complexity, the, these really complex samples, these really heavy, heavily weathered crude oils that you have to be able to understand what's going on inside the ICR cell to know that you're getting the right answer. So here's just a simple um, schematic that talks about space charge. So if you have low ion number and everybody's inside the ICR cell unperturbed in their own cyclotron frequency, you can measure all of the peaks that are there and get a representation of the true ion population inside the ICR cell. If you put too many ions into the cell, then you're, we're, we're a finite ion capacity. It's like dumping water into a cup and watching it spill out onto the table. Bad things are gonna happen if you put too much charge inside the ICR cell and you only come out with one peak. Well, this was a problem for us as we started to look at compounds and samples that had 60,000, 100,000 peaks in one single sample that was derived from the oil spill. We really had to understand the space charge phenomenon to help minimize this effect on these really complex samples. So as I mentioned, we excite all the ions to a detectable radius and we detect their image charge simultaneously. In ICR theory, it's always been everybody needs to go to the exact same radius inside of the cell. But when we did that, we discovered that we were having major problems because we wanted to have, you want everybody at the same radius, so we thought, but that makes a very narrow charge of cil cylinder of charge inside the ICR cell and, and you're ending up getting really limited by space charge. So we had a postdoc who's now a staff member who works with us named Nate Kaiser, who came up with a way to do an M over Z dependent radius distribution. So what I'm showing here on the left is a simulation of what the charge looks like inside of the ICR cell. If we have a constant radius, so we're exciting all of the ions to the exact same radius inside the cell, which is about 35% of the cell radius or we apply an M over Z radius distribution. So now we've taken all of these 70 to 80,000 mass to charge ratios and we're spreading them out between 30 and 45% of the cell radius. Now everybody can breathe a little bit better. They're not bumping into each other and we can detect their actual cyclotron frequency instead of their perturbed cyclotron frequency. And so this has always been something that has been known in the ICR field, but never been able to be demonstrated. So we talked with um, Eugene Nikolaev, who's one of our consultants who works at the Russian Academy of Sciences, and he did these simulations for us. You take two ions, they're only one Dalton apart, these two mass to charge ratios. And if you look at the blue cloud here, this guy's got a million charges in a single ion packet. The red has 100,000 charges in, an, in its ion packet, and they're all rotating at their cyclotron frequency. But what you see as you go as a function of time is these clouds don't get completely destroyed. They're pretty, I mean, you see some comet tailing effect happening, but these mass to charge ratios are staying coherent in their ion motion. Thank you. Now, if we take one that's really abundant versus a little guy, so now we've got 10,000 charges to a million charges. As you go as a function of time, the big guy completely destroys the lower abundance ions. This is very problematic because you really need to be able to probe into the lower abundance species. Now, experimentally, we knew this in theory, but experimentally we'd never demonstrated this, so we took a petroleum sample and we ran it at constant excitation radius inside the ICR cell, and across this given mass range we had 14 assigned peaks. Then we applied our radius distribution based on the mass to charge ratio, and we get a two-fold increase in the number of peaks dependent. So petroleum was able to solve a problem for physics. It was a great coup in our, in our field. 
So this is, in 2005, some of the advancements that show that we were essentially doing the experiment wrong until about five years ago. So this was the most complex mixture ever resolved and identified. Um, this is a heavy crude oil. It was from 2005. There's 11,000 peaks in it, um, uh, but this is at a much lower baseline um, noise level. And there's 55 peaks in a single nominal mass unit. So we're looking at 11,000 peaks and 55 per nominal mass within at 2005, and now here we go. This is an oil sample that was derived from um, the Deepwater Horizon. We have 85,000 peaks identified in one single mass spectrum exper experiment. And if you look in a very small, narrow mass window, there's 171 molecules that have a mass to charge ratio that differ by less than 400 millidalton. So this is a new world record um, of the number of peaks in a single spectrum. And if you zoom in even farther, this is why we need to have ultra-high resolving power. You have species in, in these samples that differ in mass by less than the mass of an electron, and we can separate them and identify them just by accurate mass measurement alone. So if you put all of these, you were able to resolve and identify all of your peaks, so you can look at the error distribution of all of your peak assignments. It's very central. Um, we have RMS error of 122 ppb. Um, which is across the entire distribution. And so just to show you on a plot, because I like to put everything into a graph, where we were for a single mass spectrum in 2005 is about right here. We had the Deepwater Horizon blowout in 2010, and the highest number of peaks that we've ever seen from anything from big oil was a refinery residue, which had about 30,000 peaks in it. All of the rest of these are weathered oil samples. So high magnetic field, FTICRMS, requires petroleum. And if you want to know how bad it can get, this is a refinery residue sample um, that we were able to look for. This is a non-distillable fraction um, that has 244 peaks across less than a Dalton in um, their mass-to-charge ratio. So I always like to take Mother Nature whenever I can. I'll always bet on her. So compositional diversity, Mother Nature ver versus big oil, if you just do a direct comparison. So this is a residue that's been exposed to extremely high temperatures, very heavy catalytic cracking. It's been at o over 600 degrees Celsius, and there's 30,000 peaks in it. And this was, at the time, the highest number of peaks resolved and identified. Now we look at what happened from the Deepwater Horizon. This is a tarbor, the taller ball that washed ashore in Gulf Shores, Alabama, and it's got a twofold increase in the number of peaks. Keep in mind that this has only been exposed to reservoir temperatures, which are less than 150 degrees Celsius in the Gulf of Mexico, and in, essentially environmental conditions. So she's not modifying it with temperature. She's not modifying it with pressure. It's all biodegradation. She's the best organic chemist. One of the big goals of our work is to try and disentangle photooxidation, evaporation, and how oil changes in the environment. And you can just see real quickly, looking at bulk properties, that you have an increase in the oxygen um, from a tar ball that you, when you compare it to the whole crude, which that increased oxygen pushes it outside of the analytical window for nearly all other techniques because of the increased polarity. So the heavier amount of weathered oil, the, hev the longer that the oil's been weathered, the worse it becomes and the more you need FTICR MS to be able to identify these species. When you look at something that was collected from the wellhead to a surface slick versus what made it to the beach versus what's been degraded on a rock, um, if you do very simple bulk property characterization, it's all polar. It's not going to come off of any GC column. There are no other analytical techniques that can address the complexity of petroleum. One thing we've done is we're very near and dear to Florida, of course, because we live there, is look at oil that is washed ashore on Pensacola Beach and do coring, um, similar to what does what happens with the ice cores and looking at the molecules that have migrated down um, into the sediments um, as a function of depth. So just to quickly highlight and then I'll summarize, with the Deepwater Horizon pre-spill crude oil, if you understand the molecular fingerprint before it was exposed to the environment and then compare it to what was washed ashore, you see that this is the Deepwater Horizon crude. This is what is washing ashore. You've lost all of the light compounds. Everything that you're left with is very heavy, highly polar, compositionally complex, um, and you have to be able to understand the molecules present to know of the environmental impact of oil. 
If you zoom in at one nominal mass unit, pick about 549 here and do the comparison. So this is the horizon, deep water horizon crude oil. It flows, it's very light crude oil, and you've got 17 peaks per a one Dalton window. And then compare it to a tar, the same sample that we showed before, a tar ball. Nearly every peak within that same window has multi oxygen atoms um, present. Whereas in the deep water horizon crude oil, you've got hydrocarbons, some lower order oxygen, but this increased polarity, the increased oxygen number means that these compounds are now more water soluble. So they're more water soluble, they're going to be able to get into the ecosystem and infect um, the aquatic environment. So now we know that weathered petroleum requires even higher magnetic field, FTICRMS. So we knew this. We didn't predict the oil spill, but in 2008, we were funded by National Science Foundation to design and develop the, 20, the first 21 Tesla FTICR mass spectrometer. And this is an overhead shot of this. We're slated to go on the floor cross our fingers, May 2013. Um, the design of the 21 Tesla instrument, instrument was um, conducted in conjunction with the Magnet Science and Technology Group at the MagLab, um, but is being manufactured by Bruker and Bremen, Germany, basically because it, it's, so, it's too boring for the ms &T guys at our lab to want to work on. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank um, you for your attention, as well as acknowledge that Everything that we do at the ICR facility is basically standing on the shoulders of giants um, in terms of understanding the physics that happens inside of superconducting magnets. Um, Chris Hendrickson has been the design um, and head of our instrumentation group for about 18 years now. Alan Marshall is the director of the facility. Ryan Rogers and myself direct and control the environmental and petrochemical applications and National Science Foundation as well as Deep Sea um, for its contribution, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. We have time for some questions. Yes. Uh, first of all, great talk. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what, what's going to be the dimensions of your 21 Tesla magnet, um, the inside of it? And second, just a more general question. Um, I'm not sure, I totally, I think it's amazing how many more lines you're getting, but do you really need it? That, that's what I don't really see. In other words, you, before you were obviously lumping a lot of things together, you know, and, 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 and uh, sort of within a certain range of masses. Uh, do you really need this detail and why do you need it? Could you explain that again, please? Maybe I didn't get it. So the problem is, is that before we were only looking at the most abundant species that were in an oil sample. So we were looking at about 11,000 because the larger, the, the, the more abundant compounds were making the larger ion clouds. And then when you get them inside the ICR cell, you're losing the complexity of all the peaks that are the lower abundance. The problem is, is that the lower abundance molecules are the ones that cause the major problems in the refinery. So petroleum is only about 5% to 15% composed of molecules that contain a polar chemical functionality. But you're not going to see those um, because they're only 5 to 15% of the total bulk of the oil. So you really have to be able to characterize these very low abundant species to be able to know that they're present and to understand the true composition of the oil in and of itself. More importantly, our accurate mass measurements are simply just a, a number put into a formula calculator if we don't ground ourselves on isotopic signatures. And nine times out of 10, the lower abundant peaks are going to have one or even two of those heavy isotopes, C13, sulfur 34s, which are the only way that we can unambiguously identify a peak when you have two possibilities, the only thing you can ground yourself in as a mass spectrometrist is to go back to the isotopes. So that is one of the ba big limitations of not being able to look at the lower abundant species. Uh, thank you very much. I think we need to move on to the next talk. Thank you very much, Amy. <laughs>